Hi, I'm Bill Friesen. I'm a sculptor. And as I look out here, I know a certain number of you. However, most that I don't. So I think what I'll do is sort of give you a little bit of a history of how I got involved in art and how it evolved in being a sculptor. So I'm a wartime baby. I was born in 1940 in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I lived in, that, in the downtown area, right across the street from the amphitheater, which was the arena at the time. And there was no kids in the area that I lived. So uh, there wasn't a whole lot of playing with other kids, so I had to find something to do by myself. My father and, uh, uh, actually I should say, there was three families lived in this tenement uh, that we had. There was my uncle and my aunt, my grandmother and my, my father and mother. So my father and my uncle were off into the military. So there was three women in the house and they kept me entertained, I guess. <laughs> One of the things that uh, I remember that sort of uh, was indelibled into my mind when uh, become an artist or what art was all about was every year and my aunt and my mother would get me up I go to the second floor window and watch all this activity coming up and down the street. There'd be elephants pulling wagons and horses pulling wagons and camels and any number of things. And then they'd set their tents up behind our property where the Granite Curling Club was. So every year, after the circus had arrived, I would be taken to the circus and I was just spellbound by the activity and the colors and in particular clowns and uh, so one of the things that would happen to keep me busy my aunt would get these scribblers and uh, i would draw pictures in them if you can imagine what a four or five year kind of picture it looked like and i guess i really was into it because every time i sat down i'd complete a whole book and uh, then my aunt would get me one day and say, okay, tell me the story that you've done here. And of course I go through and this is something that happened at the circus and this was the balloon and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so that would be fine. And another day would come along and probably take up the same book. And the story would be totally different. So it's kind of a graphic novel in, my, in the early stages. So I always had drawing in particular as an interest. And when we moved uh, into a wartime house after my father returned, I uh, got into elementary school and they had art classes, believe it or not. So uh, that was probably my favorite uh, subject. And they would go uh, give you plaster castings and what have you. And I kept my interest in that. And uh, we then moved into a uh, wartime house or a peacetime house again. We had a basement. And uh, so I did that grade five or six, something like that. And I won a couple of contests for posters. And one of the uh, prizes for uh, uh, doing the posters was you had some art classes at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, which was right downtown, right behind the Hudson Bay Company, for those that know Winnipeg. And all I can remember about the art classes was that uh, one day, there was other studios in there. But a couple of the other young boys and myself were walking along and we looked in this other studio. And lo and behold, there was a naked lady in there. <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they were doing a light drawing, of course. So when I got back to school, of course, I had to tell everybody, oh, naked ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really popular for a while. <laughs> when I got into uh, high school, uh, I kind of let art sort of Fade away. I was into sports, spent a lot of time in the gym, and uh, of course, we look at uh, running after all the good looking girls in the school. And it wasn't until I started working that I really got back into art. And I started carving. And uh, I would do ducks and buffaloes and muskox. One of the things was tiki jobs. And I'd go to craft fairs and uh, art shows. And I'd sell the damn thing, but I thought, oh, I thought it was pretty good. Then I got uh, a supply of 
I sold some. And I started doing sort of uh, similar to Eskimo carvings. And my young brother was here, would come over. I'd make him do all the sanding, this kind of stuff. <laughs> and we'd sell these things to eat with the full Eskimo art. <laughs> And sort of as I uh, progressed, I got a young family, got married, had a young family into my 30s. And I felt that there was something missing as far as my art went. I was able to draw things, I was able to sculpt things basically. But I wanted to know why I was doing it and what was going on in my head that made me do that. So I went back to university. And uh, that was. Uh, uh, earth shattering, earth shattering moment for me, because once I got in there and you started to meet some of the people that you read about or heard about, they would have uh, guest lectures. One was Buckminster Fuller, another one was Alan Capro, who was uh, a popularist in the '60s. He used to have great houses and uh, coffee shops and what have you. Um, David Smith, who was a uh, the steel sculpture, and he really sort of uh, got me going. And uh, he had been in the Navy and he was a welder and he hadn't had any art training. He came out of the Navy and decided, and I think he hooked up with a couple of other artists in New York and decided, well, he's going to be a sculptor, utilize his skill as a welder, it's a beautiful stuff. And as, again, all of these people that came along had different ideas of things and point you in different directions of thinking. So I would go to lectures in the, by the choreographers of the World Olympic Ballet and the experimental dancers. And they would explain how to use space in the stage. The, uh, there was a registrar in the, um, in the university, and I have to say, went to university for 11 years, believe it or not. <laughs> um, I, I kept working, so I would take two and three courses a year. But this registrar, once she got to know me, would say, Bill, this is the course you've got to take this year. One of the ones was experimental film. And uh, the fellow was from New York and had known all the experimental film, was Brackage and Jonas Mankus, who was important to me, um, uh, explaining how they saw things and uh, how they used the camera to make a statement. And uh, one of the things that Mankus did was a beautiful uh, series of uh, film on the uh, Arm and Bailey surface in Madison Square Garden. So what he would do is point the camera, take a minute or two, wind it back, superimpose another shot on the camera, wind it back, and do it up to four times. And when you saw the image, the finished image, You'd have this kaleidoscope of movement and color going back and forth in front of you. And I thought, how would a sculptor depict that in a different way? And that it sat in my head, brewed away for about 10 years. And when I first moved out here, this is what came out of it is the uh, Cirque Fry, which is a scrap iron circus. And uh, so I tried to duplicate a lot of the action and visual uh, activity that Mancus had done in his, in his films. Um, the other thing that I uh, picked up in university was the study of uh, Inuit art. And I found that Inuit art is considerably different than West Coast Native art and Prairie Native art. The original stuff, they have these beautiful little amulets of masks and things like that. Like wonder, well, why did they make them so small? And of course, they were nomads. And when they moved, they had to take this stuff with them. So when they actually started learning from uh, other artists that went up north and tried to teach them how to build bigger pieces, which were saleable, um, of course, you wouldn't take a 50-pound rock from one place to another, but a little piece about the size of a baseball, you could stick it in your pocket or in your pack. And so I found that to be interesting. And I also got really involved in mythology, mythology of other nations and other countries. And uh, I thought to myself, well, what is the mythology of me and the white 
North, Northern European uh, culture. And so most of these masks are elements of that. And you can see that my interest in clowns comes out. Uh, my interest is some sort of a political statement, uh, and the others are sort of uh, self-portraits. Um, I've always thought of myself as a working man, and I've been a supporter of unions, and have been in unions, and a lot of blue-collar uh, events. I've been an activist in Winnipeg and out here, and uh, one of the things I like dealing with is steel, scrap steel. I find scrap steel to be really exciting. So I find a gold mine to be. And as when I do pieces um, with the found, found steel, I consider myself working in a collaborative with the person who dug the ore out of the ground, then somebody who may already rolled the steel and somebody else took it and cut it in pieces and made something and, chuck the piece away that I'm using. So I feel that all of those unknown people are actually part and parcel of the finished piece. I can't put their name on it, but in my mind, they've, uh, they're collaborators. And I also like to do collaborative work. And there's people here today that uh, I've worked with, uh, Jeff and my good wife, Marcy. And, uh, I find it really interesting when you work with other people that you bounce ideas off each other and one will take you and draw you into one direction or another direction. And I might have an idea that I thought was great and find out, well, it really wasn't that good after all. <laughs> I've had uh, numerous shows in Winnipeg, numerous shows out here. And in Winnipeg, um, I was lucky, uh, there's a lot of teaching staff in the university would purchase pieces of me. And uh, my supply at, at, for the larger pieces was the CN uh, shops in Winnipeg. So I'd go in there and uh, there'd be wrecked boxcars that had been derailed or decommissioned. And uh, so I used to buy a boxcar, I think it was 150 bucks for scrap steel. And uh, so I'd make a deal with the guys in, this, in that particular part of the shop. I go in with a sculpture room, which is a little marking thing that sculptors use on steel, and mark out this part of the box cutter, this part here, and this part here. Can you cut that out for me? And he said, sure. So I would get most of my material from them in a couple of scrap yards that were close by. Interesting thing one day I went in there and I got to have a little ranger truck to give you an idea of the size of it. And loaded it up with uh, steel that I wanted and oh, you have to have some of this, and you have to have some of that. And it was sort of just sitting there and the guy said, Oh, you need some cleans. And I said, What the heck are cleans? Oh, he says, That's from the other shop. So that, what it is is new material that hasn't been used in the cutting set. So there's pieces that are six inches, 10 inches wide, and maybe four feet long. So this forklift truck that is coming down the road, bouncing up and down, they load my truck up in the front end. <laughs> <laughs> and so hey, you got to expect the old Ukrainian guys to work there. Say, oh, don't worry, go get our wheels. They said, what? They said, go get one of, one of the wheels. They were going to hook it onto the front of my car. So it melts down. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You better take some off. <laughs> so I gingerly left there with my truck sort of <laughs> hit the front and off and on. Didn't be there go over a big ball. There's been lots of experiences um, in um, making art and the art world. And uh, in the late 80s, there was a sculpture conference in uh, Toronto. And it was uh, really exciting for me. One of the artists that was there was a guy by the name of Marcus Subro. And what he does is uh, welded steel, usually big beams. He's the kind of guy that cuts tanker cars in half and hangs them up, things like that. And he was building a, a sculpture on the ground for this conference. 
and invited anybody that wanted to come out and work on it in the mornings. So I was there, of course, and uh, how he bent these things, they could almost be as high as this table and as wide. So you can imagine the weight of them. You just cut a piece in the center part, you heat it up, and there'd be a two ton or three ton block put on one end, they had a big crane, and when it was heated up, then they bend it up and uh, drill a few holes and then start to put it together. So it was really exciting to see how somebody could use the material that big and that size and, and handle it. So I sort of liked that. The other one was uh, Marshall McLuhan was there. And he's another person that uh, basically has a big influence on my, the way that I make art. And he had uh, challenged sculptors that we didn't see things the way that the natural world existed. And of course, everybody's sitting there saying, huh? Oh. He said, well, sculptors make things that are grounded. He said, you have everything, you know, you have a statue that's grounded. And he said, if you think about it, the only thing that never moves is space. Everything else is in a constant state of flux made up of molecules, little molecules are going around. The, if you go into the, uh, the Earth is in orbit around the sun and the uh, pla uh, planets are circulating around each other and they're in the universe bouncing off all over the place. And so I challenge you, and you, to take a different approach to art and make things look as if they are lighter and they move, and they're like, hmm, how do you do that? And so again, these are sort of examples of the kind of things that I do. And uh, to make that and emphasize the movement, I uh, spent a lot of time studying a, a guy by the name of Joseph Alberts who did color theory. And all he did was make patches of different colors and place one over the other. And lo and behold, you could put two colors or three colors and uh, put them together and the center one will totally change. It won't be as the color that you've actually put there. So if you take uh, yellow and blue, orange and blue, they kind of repel each other visually. So it, uh, I mean, you can't see it. something's not floating, but visually they make it, make it feel like it's pulling apart. So I try to use those kind of uh, ideas in a lot of the sculptures that I do. I like doing big stuff. It's kind of hard to bring big stuff in here. <laughs> so, and these are mm, fairly old. I think these uh, were done in around 2000. And like I said, that, that idea had been floating around in my head for well over a decade. And the second one there, you see sort of something that looks like a tiger going through the roof. Well, my brother and I are working on one right now that's probably about uh, 11 feet high. So we're finally getting into the big stuff. 